Chapter 18 goes over in detail the genome and how an organism's genome can be essentially sequenced and compared to other organisms. And by comparing to other organisms, whether present or past, we can tie together the idea of evolution. One of the ways in which genomes are studied is by using computers and making computations to analyze data. Um, when we're looking at a genome, which can be tens if not hundreds of thousands of different types of genes, trying to understand what those genes do, how they interact, and just the fact that they're sequenced. So there is a database, the National Center of Biotechnology Information, uh, known as the NCBI. It's a database, basically, that uh, sequences different types of genes for many, many, many different types of organisms, thanks to bioinformatics. Um, studying the actual genes is called genomics, and specifically when we focus just on proteins, that's known as proteomics. So even though the gene is really important and that's the instruction guide, the proteins basically do the heavy lifting of the cell. They um, carry, as you guys all know, they carry chemical messages, um, they operate as enzymes, they're for structure, they do just so many different jobs and they're not trapped in that nucleus. So studying them is also very important as well. In science, one of the huge projects or undertakings that research institutions, universities have all rallied together and worked together since 1990 to accomplish is the Human Genome Project. This project uh, began in 1990 and the purpose was to sequence the entire human genome. So what that means is sequencing the actual order of nucleotides in every single chromosome that makes up, in this case, a human or any organism. And when you understand the sequence of um, the nucleotides, understanding which genes can code for proteins to be synthesized and made and have a purpose, uh, what genes are essentially uh, not useful or don't code for anything, and just understanding it all together. This project, uh, quite a huge project, happened across many different countries, um, was completed in 2003. And in 2018, so last year, the number of genomes that have been sequenced this far, extending beyond humans, which has been really exciting for scientists, around 130,000 prokaryotes, their genomes have been sequenced. Now, when we look at that number compared to around 5,000 eukaryotes, that obviously makes sense because prokaryotes have very simple cells. They do not have as much genetic material. So um, sequencing their genomes is much easier than eukaryotes. And then also viruses having genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA, about 14,000 of their genomes have been sequenced this far. One of the methods used in studying the human genome is called the whole genome shotgun approach. And what this does is it takes a chromosome and the DNA and it cuts it randomly and clones those pieces. And from there, those pieces or fragments are sequenced. And, you know, even though they're cut randomly, thanks to a computer program, wherever the sequences overlap over and over and over again, it's able to be sequenced uh, from that. So wherever there's repetition, um, it would be, you know, obviously counting as the same piece. Um, but then from all that program putting everything together, uh, we're able to see the sequence of the base pairs in the way that um, they come up in that chromosome. 
when looking at human DNA and the complexity of our eukaryotic cells, there are about 3 billion base pairs. Of these uh, 3 billion base pairs, um, 20,000 are genes. So try to remember that what a gene is, a gene is what controls the development of something, whether it's making a protein, development um, of, again, signaling hormones, growth, basically everything that codes uh, for our body plan, our structure, for our cells to function, and basically life in general, uh, what the genes control. So of those 3 billion base pairs, only 20,000 of those are genes. They have a purpose. Of those 20,000 genes, about 1.5% codes for protein synthesis or RNA to be uh, synthesized or transcribed. And of um, all the different DNA, most of it is repetitive. So as I was saying on one of the previous slides, when we analyze via computer programs, you can see many different sequences uh, come up are really repetitive and present in many different copies of our chromosomes. When studying, analyzing, and sequencing DNA, it's known and uh, figured out that about 75% of the DNA is repetitive. So we have several, if not many, base pairs occurring in a certain order, and then it occurs again. Uh, then it occurs again in the same order, and on and on and on. Now, that is known as transposition, where you have stretches of DNA that can be moved from one location to another in a genome. Now, this was discovered by Barbara McClintock, excuse me, and she studied uh, and was a scientist in the 1940s, 1950s. She studied corn, and she'd studied them over many generations, and there's a certain gene that controls uh, the color of the kernel. And she saw that over time that this could often change, which we actually saw when we did the, the corn lab, that some of the kernels or seeds were speckled in a sense. So why were they turning color? What was disrupting that gene that um, controlled color, basically? There's going to be two types of uh, ways that DNA can be moved from one location to another, like we see in the corn. One of the types is known as transposons. The other type is known as a retrotransposon. So when we study a genome, what exactly accounts for the base pairs or that sequence to happen in a certain order and then downstream in looking at the DNA, it happens again, and then it happens again, and happens again. What accounts for that repetition of DNA? So something known as a transposon is what one method of how DNA has so many uh, different pieces that are repetitive. So in this case, the genome is going to need an intermediate. There's going to be something that helps assist with that repetition. In this method, it's cut and paste or copy and paste. And that intermediate in between requires the enzyme transposase, which is going to copy the DNA sequence as it is, or a tidbit basically, or fragment. And if you look at the picture um, towards the bottom of the screen, you can see the shaded uh, dark piece, which is the transposon itself. So it's a certain sequence of DNA that enzyme is going to copy that sequence. Now in this diagram, it is a copy and paste method. So down the way, um, downstream, that transposon is inserted into the DNA sequence. Now this can occur and occur and occur. What is not being shown is if it was cut out and then pasted elsewhere as well, which that can also happen as well. Another method by which DNA can become very repetitive is by a retrotransposon. 
In this case, we are not going directly from the DNA into another piece of DNA, which gets inserted. Again, that's known as a transposon. In this case, we have to have RNA to be synthesized. Also in this case, there is not going to be a cut out and paste in elsewhere. The place that is being copied, the actual retrotransposin, which is being copied, that segment of DNA that's copied, is going to always stay at the original original site. Now, like everything, there has to be an enzyme that helps assist with any process, and in this case, that's known as reverse transcriptase. So if you look at the diagram, you can see, again, the shaded blue part with the original DNA strand in the middle of the screen, and normal transcription takes place, RNA, is synthesized. Now here is where it goes different. We have reverse transcriptase is going to attach to that RNA strand that is synthesized. And instead of doing translation and leading to a protein, it is doing transcription in reverse. From that RNA strand and the transcriptase enzyme, the original DNA sequence is going to be made. And then from there, uh, the complementary strand is made. And then we have a fragment that is going to be inserted downstream. So now we have the original retrotransposin. And then we have downstream another copy with the same exact sequence. And that is another method in which, in this case, eukaryotes primarily use retrotransposins to be so repetitive of nucleotides, whether it's two to five, sometimes it can be in the hundreds, um, it's known as a short tandem repeat. Now the number of copies is going to vary from site to site or location on the DNA or chromosome, and it's very unique to each person because they have a unique set of genetic markers. So if you have five um, nucleotides like G, T, T, A, C, that is going to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Um, and that's going to be unique. So in, in my genome, maybe that repeat is going to occur seven times. But maybe in my husband's genome, that's going to occur 10 times. And then maybe in yours, it occurs 12 times. So what we have to keep in mind, even though our nucleotides are different, we're still all human beings and we have very similar chromosomes, but there are these little differences that, again, make us all different. And a short tandem repeat is one way in which, again, our repetitive DNA that doesn't code for anything makes us unique. And from that, we can have a genetic profile created by the uniqueness of those short tandem 